Pues po podemos proceder a, a la plática del día de hoy, el coloquio. El coloquio está a cargo de Tom Frese, quien ha sido un colaborador y ha estado involucrado con el C3 desde hace muchos años. Nos ha apoyado en muchos sentidos y con muchas ideas interesantes. Este, mi experiencia con Tom es que cada vez que lo oigo habla de algo distinto, del cual no sé nada, pero es algo muy entretenido y está muy interesante lo que está trabajando. En este caso, algo sé del código genético, pero para nada lo que él está trabajando. Él trabaja en el Instituto de Investigaciones en Matemáticas Aplicadas y Sistemas, en el IMAS. Y pues, en lugar de quitarle más tiempo, ya, por favor, empieza y, y muchas gracias por aceptar la invitación. Sí, muchas gracias. Uy, muchas gracias, Gustavo, por la invitación de empatía del coloquio del C3. Eh, si no tienen problema, prefiero dar la plática en inglés, porque el tema es, es más o menos nuevo para mí y si voy a intentar explicar el código genético en español, me voy, voy a dar muchas bolas en la mente, entonces... Sí, <risa> exactamente. Entonces, si, si, pueden, si no entienden algo, me pregunten, si pueden preguntar en español, no hay problema, pero es más fácil el, el tema para mí en inglés. Ok. Bueno, empezamos. Um, this uh, work was done in collaboration with uh, Jorge Campos, who's sitting here, who implemented the, the model, so you can ask all the difficult technical questions and the programming questions to him. And uh, some j colleagues uh, based in Japan, because this work was uh, done this summer um, at the Earth Life Science Institute in Tokyo. This is what it, what it looks like. We were invited uh, as long-term uh, visiting researchers to spend a couple of months there this summer. That's the building and some spaces. The idea is a little bit similar to the C3, actually. So it's all about creating open spaces for interaction, They have uh, lots of workshops, visiting researchers from all over the world. It's almost like, you know, a whirlwind. You're there and all the time there's new people appearing and new events happening. It's a, it's a place full of energy. So if you're interested in the Earth life sciences, this is one of the best places to, to visit. Uh, Gustavo asked me uh, actually to originally to present a kind of introduction to all my research and uh, I said I don't have time to do all of that um, but I just want to give you a flavor of my background before I get into the topic. So I was fortunate enough to do a master's in cybernetics. Now what's cybernetics, right? Cybernetics era is actually something that came before cognitive science, right? So this is something that started in the late 40s, really flourished in the 50s and 60s And uh, it was one of the first truly multidisciplinary or even transdisciplinary sciences uh, in which you had uh, people from psychology, physics, biology, sociology, anthropology coming together to try to understand phenomena in a systems kind of way, right? So to some extent, it's, you know, the preceding movement before complex systems of what we know today. And they had mobile robotics. They, they invented neural networks, right? Uh, some different kinds of mobile robotics. Actually, this is the more classical uh, one where you have reasoning. This is the more kind of embodied one where it's all about sensory motor loops. You know, the first computers were being built and you had the first instances of artificial life where um, uh, this is Gordon Pass's ear. He actually tried to grow an ear by passing electric currents through some sort of like salt solution. So lots of crazy ideas were being uh, Uh, invented here, but the winner in the end, you might have guessed it, was information technology. So the computers that we see for Neumann standing next to the bottom. And that then basically dominated the kind of origins of cognitive science and computer science, where we had this focus on the more, and uh, like I would say, a rationalistic style of doing robotics. And I'm going to jump through several decades of research now. This was you know, maybe 60s, 70s. Then in the 80s, people started being interested in neural networks again, so the connectionist movements appeared. Um, 
And also these embodied robotics where sensory motor loops were taking an important uh, role again, also reappeared in the 90s. And so basically people were reinventing cybernetics in new guises. Um, and what, yes? Yes, thank you. Yes, I almost ran into that one over there. <laughs> uh, the kind of upshot of this, where was this heading, was that there was um, a distancing from some of the philosophical premises that were driving this work. People were interested in the computations that were taking place inside this machine, symbolically, and what the neural networks gave us was a way of thinking about that in a distributed way. So the symbols were now activity patterns spread out over different nodes. And what the robots gave us was that uh, things didn't have to just happen on the inside. Also the interactions between systems made a difference for how, for the, how the activity in the systems unfolded. And so to some extent, the kind of dynamical picture of cognition that grew out of this gives us this view of the mind where of course the brain is important, but the brain is actually embodied in a living body, and the living body is situated in an environment in which all of these are in constant interaction. And as you know from complex systems theory, when you have nonlinear coupling between systems, what you get is a bigger system that integrates them and there's new activity happening that can't be reduced to just isolated components. Right? So this is a very different view of cognition from one that says everything happens inside the brain. Now my interest in this was to say, what if we think about this kind of approach when it comes to understanding life, not just mind. And so I proposed that we should have something like a behavior-based approach to the origins of, of life. Because some of the philosophical assumptions that were driving the origins of cognitive science were also influencing this field. So we have famously two, two big communities in this field. One says metabolism came first, right, and, and uh, genetic replication so come later. The other says, no, we had uh, replication first. It's kind of like RNA world scenario, and metabolism is actually more like the side aspect. But what we found is that both of these, to some extent, assume that the first instances of life were passive and encapsulated individuals, right? So behavior didn't play any role in either of these scenarios. And all the important stuff happened on the inside of them, right? So either you have a metabolic network doing its work or you have replication of some sort of um, informational molecules, right? So they don't think about what could occur when we have intermediate time scales between metabolism and evolution of behavior, of development, of change, of interaction with the environment, right? I'm not going to go into that too much here, but there's a, a whole lot of literature now looking at this. We had one big conference while we were in Tokyo on this topic. And basically, it goes to show that once you look at those time scales, you find lots of interesting work. So, for example, even a simple self-replicating um, molecular network, if you put it into a nutrient gradient, right, it will actually move up or grow up the gradient. Right? So that's already adaptive behavior. But people hadn't noticed this because either they were looking at things in a well-stirred reactor, so you don't have any spatiality, or they were just assuming things were encapsulated so there's no interaction with the environment, right? So then I said, well, okay, this is all very nice, simple behavior, but we need the next step. We also need to say something about the genetic code, the informational aspect. Um, and one inspiration here is that one of my other research topics is looking at the origins of language. And in that community too, we have a kind of split between the classical approach, which sees language mainly as some internal, innately specified thought system, symbolic system. And another group of people are saying, no, in order to understand language, we have to think about it as something that we do in interaction with other people. Right? And that's a... Uh, uh, has given rise to what is called the iterated learning model. And the basic idea here is that we have to change our perspective from the individuals to the languages. Right? So the, the key problem is, why do babies learn languages so easily? Right? Given that they only have partial input of the language, nobody explains them the grammar. Right? That's something that you learn in school much later. So how do they do it so easily? And multiple languages at that, right? Given such a sparse input. 
Or people thought the only answer can be that the language has to be innately specified somehow. We have to have a universal grammar inside of us that allows us to learn them. The other possibility is that languages are so easily learnable because those languages that are not learnable were not passed on. So imagine a language that is so difficult to learn that nobody can really do it. Well, it won't have a chance to be passed across the generations, right? So they actually, the selection pressure here is on the languages to be as learnable as possible because those languages that were not learnable wouldn't survive. Right? So we're turning this logic around, right? Suddenly, we're talking about the interaction between people being the source of selection here. Okay? So, what, so the key idea I proposed here was, what if the same is true of the origins of the genetic code? Right? What if the, fa uh, the fact that genetic codes had to be transmitted between individuals put pressure on the genetic codes to be transmittable? Right? Because if the receiving individual, or this one that gets the, the, the part of the genetic code, cannot interpret it or cannot make use of it, that code will not be passed on. Right? So it's the same logic, but now applied um, to the origins of life and the origins of the genetic code. And of course, the comparison between language and the genetic code is not you know, my invention. There, this has been noted for a long time, uh, particularly in this uh, book, Major Transition of Evolution, uh, which has a more popular science version of it. If you're interested, this is a nice little book. Right? It actually says here, from the birth of life to the origins of language. For them, the two most important transitions in the history of life are precisely those two because they represent major changes in how information was uh, transmitted. Okay, so let's get a little bit more in detail. What is the iterated learning paradigm? And to understand how we can apply it to the origin of uh, life. So now starting from, the, from language, right? So the iterated learning experiments, so these have been done with actual people, it's not just computer simulations. Show language evolution in action. You can do this in a lab and see how, how, what happens. They say, in all our experiments, we have shown that languages, by virtue of being culturally transmitted, become increasingly learnable and increasingly structured. Key advantages of this kind of behavior-based evolution. Right? So now, individuals are the source of selection, not only the environment. So we have another explanatory resource here. Behavior-based cultural evolution takes place at a much faster time scale than mutation-based biological evolution. Right? So the changes here, uh, so no, to put it differently, because of this difference in time scales, right, it means again that the pressure is on the languages to adapt. Right? The turnover is much faster. And we get combinatorial representations emerging for free. So in their experiments, they show how words start to become modular and certain parts of words pick out certain features. Right? So how does this happen? In a kind of review paper, uh, some, some of the major people in this field uh, put it this way. The key to this apparent magic is the obligatory dependence of the process of intergenerational transmission on the sparse sampling available to the language learner of the linguistic output of the population of language users. So now the sparsity, which was a problem for the original account, becomes part of the process. Right? It's because it forces the learners to generalize. Right? If you had a complete representation of the language, no generalization would be made. The process through which utterances are filtered through this learner bottleneck creates competition among inquit linguistic forms for access to subsequent generations. This is the other part, right? If you can't learn the language and reproduce it properly, it won't be passed on to the next generation. But if you reproduce it slightly differently, right, there's the kind of mutation if you want, then the next generation will have a, a language that perhaps might be more easily learnable. Yep. from internal self-consistency versus, because obviously the semantic, this sounds more like grammar than semantics, because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, in some sense, the most important part of language is that it means something. 
Mm -hmm. In other words, hey, you represent something in an environment, and if you represent it well, it can give you a fitness uh, advantage. Right? Yes. So in other words, it's kind of an endogenous and exogenous type of uh, fitness. One is just pure self-consistency to be able to say, hey, I understand mm -hmm. uh, in some sense what you're saying, yes. but the other thing is that what does it really mean for yes. me in the sense of what I should do, right? Yes, yeah. you're, you're very right. These are two different things. And, and what they, they, these people claim is that this can do both. Right, so I'm actually going to give you an example now. So this is one of those experiments where they actually use people instead of computers. Um, so people were presented uh, with, uh, in front of a screen with some different stimuli. So they could be one of three shapes, one of three colors, and one of three movements. Okay? And then they were given a random letter string. And they said, okay, you have to learn that, let's say, a red square that's moving from left to right is called nere blobla right? Oh my god, how are you gonna do that? And then you have to do it for all of them? Very difficult, right? And then, here's the trick, right? You're supposed to learn this. Of course it's impossible at the beginning because random strings, how are you supposed to match random strings to this, right? You're asked to produce what you think you remember were the strings. So they present you with another thing. Let's say, in the test phase, Oh, okay. In the test phase, you're again presented with a square that's red and moving to the right, and you're asked, okay, so what was it called? And people, of course, can't reproduce this properly, right? But whatever they say will be now the new training string for the next learner. And if you do this iteratively, that's why it's called the iterative learning paradigm, what happens is that spontaneously structure emerges, such that linguistically you can analyze the phrases now, such that, uh, let's see, at the top we have ne re ki, le re ki, re na na. All of these with N at the front seem to pick out gray objects. Right? So now we have something which is kind of like grammar, right? So the first part of the string codes color and it tells you which one, right? So L is blue and R is red. And you can do that for the other features as well. It's not perfect. And people don't know this is happening. But basically, you're starting to get grammar and meaning appearing for free. Just by asking people to try to reproduce initially random letter strings for naming features. Okay, so this is, well, this is what happens in practice now. How do we go from there to the genetic code? In fact, uh, even people uh, like Wose here, who is one of the big names in the field, or was one of the big names in the field studying the origins of the genetic code, have noted the similarity to language. And interestingly, uh, his view of the origins of the genetic code is actually quite similar to the iterated learning paradigm. Right? Let me see if I Okay, so he also agrees that, that here, the origins of genetic codes was one of the most important similar transitions. And he says, quite differently from the other theories, as we will see, that the dynamic of horizontal gene transfer is primarily determined by the organization of the recipient cell. And at the very origin of life, aboriginal cell designs are taken to be simple and loosely organized, Enough that all cellular componentry can be altered and are displaced through HGT, or essential gene transfer, making each CT the principal driving force in early cellular evolution. Okay, this is the key. Whereas most other theories of the uh, origin of the genetic code talk about Darwinian evolution, right, where the fitness is associated with having a nice genetic code, right, an optimal code, he says no. At the beginning, we can't assume that Darwinian evolution was happening, right? Because we didn't have a genetic code. We didn't have a good genetic translation system. So the most plausible scenario for the origin of life is that there was a loose mixture of stuff floating around and being passed between different protocells, or what he calls progenots, right? He calls this communal evolution. He says the high level of novelty required to evolve cell designs, and he's talking about the uh, last universal common ancestor, is a product of communal invention of the universal HDT field, not interlineage variation. Okay, this is, he was very much alone with this proposal for a long time. Everybody else thought this is crazy. 
Right, things are changing now. So his idea that we need something like this universal field, this common innovation, to explain the rapid emergence of the last common ancestor, right, is actually still very pertinent today. Okay, here are two, two papers from the last couple of years. One says that, you know, 3.7 billion years ago we have microbial structures, and the other one says that maybe up to 4. Point, you know, say 4.3 billion years ago. But how old is the Earth? Four point. Exactly. So, so basically, as soon as it was possible for there to be life, there was life. Okay, and life that is uh, recognizable for us today, meaning that in such a short time span, something must have happened that allowed this huge complexity to emerge. And he thinks that Darwinian evolution is not fast enough for that. Right? He, that's why he's interested in this kind of horizontal collective style of evolution. Here's another interesting thing. There's a shift in the community of the origins of life research from what has been for many decades now the focus, which is deep sea vents. Right? So on the very like, deep ocean floors, you have volcanic fissures in which seawater enters and comes into contact with the hot core and spews out the super hot water with all these minerals and you even have like very interesting ecosystems down there that are totally independent from light. Right? So that was a long time of focus. But there are a lot of problems with this scenario. I'm not an expert in it, but for example, these organisms have to deal with the problem of salt water. Right? You have to have some sort of active process of making sure you don't have too much salt inside of yourself. In, in fresh water, that's not a problem. Another problem is that we're talking about the ocean here, right? And if we want fast evolution, what we need to ensure is that the organisms or the protocells are packed into a small environment so a lot of interaction can happen. If they're isolated, floating around in the oceans, with never getting into contact, well, then the speed would be very slow and, you know, maybe we'll never get started. So what has been proposed now is that we need to go back to Darwin's idea of that life might have started in a warm little pond, which he wrote in a letter to one of his colleagues. Some people call this the hydrothermal pool scenario. And it's theoretically very interesting, but also now we're finding uh, empirical support. So now people have looked at some of the rock formations in Australia seem to suggest that we had uh, some sort of like biomats uh, happening or, or around similar time spans as mentioned above, on Earth, not under the sea, right? So this has given rise to the terrestrial origins of life hypothesis, something that's just happening very recently in the field. Why is it interesting for our model? Because of this phase here, the gel phase. So the idea is that not only does this give the advantages I just talked about, it's also much more dynamic than the seafloor. Right, so you, you can think about Yellowstone Park or something like that, where you have a geyser exploding every once in a while and then it dries out again. Right? So we have a process of hydration, suddenly hot water spews out. Right? That then starts to evaporate, you have sunlight hitting it, and so on, a kind of gel forms, right? and then it gets into a solid form where there's a very tight interaction, and then you get rehydrated and things disperse again. So we have a natural mechanism here of recombination and dispersal through this kind of uh, hydration-rehydration cycle. And in fact, the authors of this link their idea specifically with where is this communal evolution. So all of these lines of uh, research are pointing into the direction that maybe Wurzel was onto something. But people have remarked at least two key pro problems with Wurzel's idea. One is, we're not really sure exactly what the agency of selection is in communal evolution, right? This is for people who are used to thinking in terms of Darwinian evolution only, right? And I've given you evidence that in, in language evolution, people have already started considering alternatives, but in the field of the origins of genetic code, this is still strange, right? And also, nobody has really demonstrated whether such a thing as communal evolution could actually, you know, explain the key properties of the standard genetic code. Right? So our idea was, let's create a simple agent-based model to respond to these worries. And I'm not a biologist, and suddenly I had to deal with all of this, which was a headache and took a long time. Now I think I more or less understand the basics of it. Not, okay, 
for, for those of you who, who don't know the genetic code, right, this is the translation system from where we go from a bit of DNA to something uh, functional on the end like a protein. And the way it happens is that you have these uh, molecules called TNRAs floating around that bind to certain parts on the, on the message here, right, and they leave their uh, amino acids, which they have attached there, creating these chains of amino acids, and these chains of amino acids, and they're done, fold into complex molecules, which are the proteins which have certain functions. So that's a very basic description of what is going on here, but it gives you the idea, right? Important thing is here that we have um, three points of contact, and that's where the code takes place, right? So it gives us three possibilities to vary here of how and where should we connect with this. Okay. Any questions about this? So we have four possibilities for each of these three, which gives us a total of 64 codons. And each of those 64 codons specifies one amino acid. That's the genetic code. You can put it in a table, we will see it in a moment. Okay, so how do we explain this code? Any theory of why the standard genetic code is the way it is and how it came to be must be able to address at least three key facts. This comes from a, from a review paper that's gonna come out uh, later this year. First, the code's regularity, that is expressed in non-random amino acid assignments. So you could imagine that the 64 possibility map mappings are completely random. Well, it's not like that. There is a highly regular structure of those mappings. We have to explain why is it universal across all known life, right? Why don't we just have different codes for different, like, you know, do bacteria have to have the same code as we do? Is there any reason for that, right? Also, there's this very important idea of optimality. That what happens if you make a mistake somewhere in the process of translating from the DNA to the protein? Turns out that the genetic code is such that most mistakes don't make a difference. Right? So it's like informational, you know, in your computers you have the same thing. You have error correction mechanism, redundancy. It's the same thing here. Okay, so what does it look like? Here's one way of visualizing it, where we have the triplets, right? Base one, base two, base three. These are the three positions. We have the four possible bases for each position, which give us the different possibilities, right? So here it would be U, 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 coding for amino acid fit. Or here, which one is it? Vanilla? Vanilla Linen. Vanilla Nina, okay. And you have one of those for all of these possibilities, right? And now you see that, oh, actually, these are the same amino acid here. So it turns out that if you by accident read U as C, the final protein will be still be the same one, right? So that, it doesn't actually matter, matter if you make a mistake. More so, if you look at the kind of chemical properties of the amino acids, here's one way of doing it by using the Gauss's polar requirement scale, and we color it in, we can see that even if the amino acid is different, its properties are still relatively similar. Right? So even if it's not the same amino acid, it'll be one that is more or less similar. This, in this way, it means that no matter if you make errors, yes? Yes? What about, what about uh, water? You know, they, they, that's a very important one. Yes. Are they also associated like this? Like they repel water or they attract water? Hydrophobicity is yeah, another exactly. thing that we can look at, yes. And it comes but out similar. It does? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, in fact, I had a slide showing exactly that and I removed it. I'm sorry. But yes, the, the, and this is not polarity. Polar requirement is some technique that was invented to test chemical similarity. And the, the chemist with which we were working uh, at the institute there said, don't worry, it's very obscure. We don't even really properly understand it, what this means. But it's the accepted standard in the field. But if I used hydrophobicity and we've looked at this, it's also very regular like this. You can shade in the colors with hydrophobicity and it will more or less the same. Uh -huh. Yes. 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 Yes, very good. So the different bases don't have the same weighting. 
right? So we will get to that in a moment. Actually, base three is the worst. It's it's very very unreliable. And if you can see, sorry, yes, it's the best in terms of redundancy in error correction, but it's the least reliable in terms of not making mistakes in transmission. So it seems like the system has to be optimized such that the one that's least reliable, or so the translation system makes the most mistakes in this base, therefore, there's the least change in that base, right? Whereas, as you're right, if I did a mistake here in base two, the change could be quite drastic. So this one has to be transmitted much more accurately than, than this one. In the questions, I will, I can bring it up in the question time. Okay, and uh, here's a slide for for Max and Gustavo. So why three, right? Well, uh, you know, I'll let you give let them give the details, but this is how I understand the work. What we saw in the slide where I showed you the translation system, right, is a long bit of message that's encoding for proteins. And we have a reading device that's moving along, right? Now, the question is, each one of these, you know, is one base connected with another. We have uh, to encode 20 amino acids. If we had, let's say, uh, only two bases with four letters, it wouldn't be enough. Three seems to be gives us some redundancy is too much, right? And most people always ask, why is it four letters, but not why is it three bases, right? So what they did is they showed that if we look at this as a dynamical system, that where one is moving across another and we have, a, you know, different for tensions here, we can think of it as this, right? So we want to move such that we're landing in an equilibrium with low tension, right? And if we do that, and if you assume these are long strings and they are randomly arranged, what we find is that for, for different arrangements, we have the most probable distance between equilibria to be either two moves or three moves apart. So that means that having three in the triplets, right, let's go back to this picture here. This is the reading device, right? So having three here means that there is the least amount of effort to go from one to the next because you're very likely to fall into another equilibrium three steps along. Okay, I hope I did that justice, more or less. If you have more questions about that, maybe we can discuss it in the question time. We're basically just gonna assume that they're right and we also assume that three is something that comes out very spontaneously and we adopt it in our model as a three-based system. Okay, now going back to this difference in the optimality of the basis. Okay, so we have four letters, three bases, gives us 64 possible codons, right? We need to have the tRNA coming in and connecting to them, right? So that suggests that we should have 64 tRNAs so that we can attach a specific amino acids for each possible triplet, right? And now, there are stop codons, so we could reduce them and then maybe we'll just be left with one specific, uh, 61 specific tRNAs, right? But actually it turns out that our expectations are wrong because most organisms have fewer than 45. So how is that possible, right? Well, it turns out that the third base uh, is ambiguous, right? And because of this ambiguity, you're, you're okay with 45 because the, the, the remaining ones are basically, you know, overcoded, some, something like that. You can say that the third one sometimes could be that letter, it could be sometimes read as that letter, and that's enough to fill out the entire space. Yes. I mean, you only have, you only have 20 uh, amino acids, right? Yes. So why are you talking about 45 species of transfer RNA? Do the, the, you're saying it's different for, for, for each, even when there's a generacy. So we, yes, so each of these three letters here in this table, there are 64 of them, 
if we wanted to accurately implement this table in the translation system, we would have to have 64 sure. of yes. these guys with their associated amino acids. And there's 45. There's only 45. So all I'm saying, it doesn't really matter the details here. I'm saying, what I'm saying is actually ignore it. This is a fact about the real system. In our case, we assume that all three positions are equally reliable. All right, so this is a shortcoming of our model. We have to think about how to implement this ambiguity of the third position. Maybe if you have some ideas, yes. Yes, correct. So we, there's, so we are ignoring that too. Less, yes. So we, we need to include some probabilistic uh, kind of measures uh, in our model. Maybe we can come back to that in, in the end as one of the next steps. Yes. I wonder if anybody's checked if there's anything analogous in ordinary language. In other words, if you mutate the first letter mm -hmm. of words versus the second letter of words versus third letter of words, um, how many are still in the lexicon? Yes. In other words, if you mm -hmm. change the first letter, you have a smaller percentage that's still in the lexicon versus if you change the second letter or the third letter or, mm -hmm. or something like that. That's true. And I think it's actually correct. Yes. Yeah. There, there are some perceptual psychology tests that, I don't know, when, I was, when email first came around, people were sending around this email, try to read this text, and yeah. then the button says, didn't you notice that the word came twice or yeah, the letters yeah, were yeah, missing? Yeah, exactly. Yes. exactly. Yeah. So, so but when the first one's missing, you always notice it. Yeah. So I wonder if has that been quantified in some sense? I mean, obviously you could mm -hmm. just do the statistics, uh -huh. right? Just look at a dictionary and see how many uh, t how many times it appears in the in the dictionary if you've changed the first letter versus. Uh, that's second a very interesting proposal. Yeah. Yes, I don't think anybody's done that. Right, exactly. Yeah. I think that would be a cool. So thing here's to do. a project for students, right? <laughs> and and here's another thing that uh, Max and I discussed while we were in Tokyo, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, I know we're discussing slightly, but I think this is interesting. So this model is not specific to the genetic system at all, right? It's talking about general statistics applied to a dynamical system with equilibria, right? So I thought, well, what if we think about this as you reading text, right? Like this kind of text. And we know that people focate a bunch of letters at the same time. Not sure exactly how many, maybe like six or so. And we have shown this, uh, people have shown this experimentally by changing the letters in your outside your focal area and people don't notice that you're doing it. So you can quantify this. This could be any text. Now we know from this that we should find that the optimal focal moving distance should be three letters. And so I did a test and looked online and it turns out that the most common word in English is three letters long. I mean, the most frequent words in English are three letters long. So perhaps this model can actually explain the most frequent words in English. Actually, uh, the SIP flow. So, okay. so you're not right. I mean, three has nothing special. It, it goes like, uh, you know, like a power law. The, the size of, uh -huh. the, of the letter, right? Uh -huh. the, the number of letters, you mean? Well, well of course, there, there's an, uh, a limit. But yeah. did you check that there's a... Number three is the most common one? Yes, and okay. it also applies to... Sip law refers more to, to, to the actual word. Sip law refers to the letters, doesn't it? No, 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 no. To, to words. words, to words, to words. words. Yes, yeah, so this is about the letters, yes. Yes. I mean, basically, you've got to remember that language got nothing to do with letters. Mm -hmm. It's to do with phonemes. Uh -huh. It's coming from a spoken okay, so thing, yes. and I bet any money mm -hmm. that kind of phonemes, in some sense, are kind of two or three letters. You don't get a phoneme that's uh, like 17 letters long. Yes, yes. Right? That's also true. So here I'm talking about our visual system, but then you can also think about our auditory system. How do we break up Well, sounds? once again, the, the, the written system, I mean, obviously in the genetic code, in one sense, it's written, not audible. Mm -hmm. But in terms of human language, it's completely a, 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 a sound system. Yes, right? but it turns out that uh, each word, like the most frequent number of syllables in a word is also three. So it also generalizes to the auditory system. Anyway. So this is for, uh, like I said, interesting student projects. You know, let's. Uh, I have to move on with my presentation here.
But uh, anyway, it's clear, right? This is a dynamical system. It doesn't, it's not specific about any kind of modality. So you can apply this across the board. So where was I? Um, OK, the wobble. And uh, OK, so <clears throat> previous models of the genetic code uh, usually assume a Darwinian kind of process. right? So what they do is they uh, assign fitness to the optimality of the code so that codes that have less um, error robustness are given worse fitness scores, right? And if you do that and you let it mutate over time, you end up with genetic codes that look kind of similar to the real genetic code. But interestingly, sometimes they're too good, right? So people have, for example, taken our genetic code, looked at the, the state space of all possible initial conditions, and then evolved them to be optimal for error correction. And it turns out that our genetic code is sitting on the side of a slope of a small fitness peak, and in the landscape, there are much higher peaks elsewhere. So then people were saying, well, that's very strange, because if this was really being optimized by evolution, we should expect at least it to be at the at top of its own fitness peak, if not on the higher fitness peaks in this landscape, right? It's not the case. So people have appealed to Francis Crick's idea of a frozen accident, right? So that once the genetic code was in place, it couldn't be changed anymore because it had too many deleterious effects on the proteins being made. Right? I'm just, but just keep that in mind. We'll come back to that later. So ap applying Darwinian evolution gets us, to some extent, two good re results. Apart from the problem that they're assuming everything in place already, like a you know functioning translation system. Then, for many people in the field, a breakthrough moment happened uh, when we teamed up with uh, some physicists working in complexity, and they added horizontal gene transfer to this model that I just discussed. And what happened when they do that? Let's just skip the details here. Is that when we have um, just normal Darwinian evolution. Here we are the, the time steps. Okay, here's uh, mean amino acid distance between code and neighbors. So like how, how much redundancy do you have, right? You get stuck here, but if you add horizontal gene transfer, you actually find uh, better codes, right? Mean code distance, and here's another thing. Not only do they find more optimal codes, they also find that there's a faster convergence to a smaller set of codes. So without horizontal gene transfer, you have a higher diversity of codes in your population. When you add uh, horizontal gene transfer, it has the effect of uh, speeding up convergence. So this could mean that uh, one explanation of universality is the presence of horizontal gene transfer. So how, what, well, what about Wurzel's communal evolution, right? So, so Wurzel was one of the co-authors of this model, right? So we have uh, evidence that improves convergence on a universal optimal code, but they still situate their model at the level of species that evolve according to fitness as measured in terms of code optimality. And so they just added this horizontal part to the standard model. Yet Wurzel's original idea was that at the beginning there were no species, and that therefore the dynamic of evolution was determined by horizontal gene transfer alone, in particular by the organization of the recipient cell. Like, can I incorporate these bits of genetic material that are floating around in my environment into my own system? Yes or no. If I can, then it can be passed on next time. If not, then, then it will you know, not be passed on. But not over generations, but over transfers, interactions between protocells. some genetic code, uh, which would mean that you would acquire a, a, a certain triplet or, or whatever, but right. it already has assigned yes. a, 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 an amino acid. Yes, so we assume triplets. That's why I had the slide on the, uh, that model with the dynamics. Um, and yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, so there must be some kind. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So we have to we have to assume that, uh, and uh, I'm not going to go into details now. But there are some people uh, who have in the lab managed to create tRNA molecules that catalyze their own uh, charging with an amino acid. So the only thing that we need to assume here, to some extent, 
is that there were some kind of proto tRNAs at the beginning that were, a, that were being passed, right? So basically, Versa says the cells were so permeable and loose that we not only did we have the normal genes being passed, but parts of the translational machinery itself was also dispersing. And so, for example, if we assume the presence of some proto tRNA at the beginning, because we have to assume at least that much, then, but then the, the rest makes a different story because we don't have to assume all of the, the high fidelity uh, translation system. Okay. Um, so here's actually, now we're getting into the, you know, getting more into the details. So what we need for versus scenario to work is that somehow the recipient cell is able to learn or incorporate the bits of genetic code that it gets from the other uh, protocells. Since nobody has any idea of how that would look like in detail, right, what we did was just uh, assume a kind of machine learning technique. This is a, a simple um, perceptron where we define as inputs the triplets, right? Uh, and this has continuous values, and we have a value for each of the four possible letters, and these two have closer values than the, between them because they derive, they're chemically more, more similar, right? And what we want the system to do is basically give us an amino acid, right? So specify, go from, from the triplet to an amino acid. And then, of course, if you change this, you could chain the amino acids into a, into a protein. How do we specify the amino acid? This is, was one of the tough parts of the work. We talked with all the chemists over there. And basically, they gave us a list of uh, values that they've been working with, because they're also looking at the space of possible amino acids in detail. So we have log P. Which one was that? This is the hydrophobicity. So we, we're actually including it here as one of the specifications of the amino acid the volume, the charge, the weight, uh, what kind of backbone class the molecule has, um, whether it has any special kind of uh, atoms in the chain, in the side chain, whether it has a benzene chain. So basically, we're mapping from a three-dimensional input to uh, an 11-dimensional output, which gives us one unique amino acid for each possible triplet of the 64 triplets, right? No third base wobble. And we have a total of 20 amino acids, which are the standard encoded amino acids. Okay. Now the idea is basically to, to model the learning part or the incorporating part just through a simple uh, backpropagation technique, right? So we uh, asked the, the network, which amino acid would you give us if we gave you this triplet? And it would say something, and then we say, no, actually wrong. You know, you should have given us a different one. And so we train it using this method to reduce its error. And this seems all very strange, right? Now we're switching to a completely different field. This actually comes from neural networks originally. But just to kind of like, you know, probe our intuitions a little bit, it's not so bizarre anymore, okay? For example, even in 91, we had a chemical implementation of neural networks and Turing machines, right? Uh, we have uh, reaction diffusion systems controlling cognitive agents that are normally controlled by continuous time recurrent neural networks. We have evidence of associative learning in chemical networks. Um, again, here, this is actually the most recent one. Uh, reaction diffusion chemistry implementation of associative memory neural network. Associative memory neural network, that's exactly what we have, right? So I'm just saying it's, it's abstract, it's kind of arbitrary, but it could, can be done in something like a reaction diffusion chemistry, right? So it's not completely uh, out of the picture. But in any case, we just treat it as a black box for the moment. So uh, the parameters of our simulation, we have 16 of these systems. We allow them to interact with each other 100,000 times. And then we'll, we'll, I'll give you the details of how they interact in a moment. We allow them to transfer parts of the genetic code, so, so these proto-TRNAs, 10 of them, for each transfer. We allow the, the network, the receiving network, to optimize its own uh, genetic code in accordance with what it has received. And we did this in 50 different independent runs. So here's the iterated learning model in detail. So uh, unfortunately, you can't see this. There are little, 16 little blobs in here. We have 16 protocells initialized. Then the iteration starts. We take a donor and a recipient 
the donor passes a subset of its uh, table to the recipient, right? The recipient adjusts its code, and then we put them back in the population and we start again from here, choosing another pair. And we do that 100,000 times. Okay? So it's basically this, right? So we, we have different genetic code tables. In the beginning, they're very low expressivity. They don't encode a lot of amino acids. Right? They don't look so good. This one is even worse, right? It doesn't specify it's just one amino acid, right? But this one transfers it across. This one tries to incorporate it into its own genetic code. And this is what results, a kind of hybrid out of the two uh, genetic codes. Okay? That's the basic principle. Now, what happens at the end? What kind of genetic codes do we find? And I'm starting to get to the, to the end of the talk. We measured, we tried to understand what we were finding in terms of three measures. One is expressivity, right? It counts the number of distinct amino acids that the code is encoding. It can be between 1 and 20. The distance between the codes, right? So how similar are the different genetic codes in the population, right? This is a kind of a measure of universality, if you want. And delta code is this error robustness measure. Like what happens if we do one letter wrong, how similar will the resulting amino acid be to the, original, the one that we wanted to code for? Okay? So it took, took a lot of time to do, right? Uh, we were using the high uh, computing performance cluster of the institute, and there were already people complaining, you're using up too much computing power, and we had to you know, lower this a bit. This is 100,000 uh, iterations, and we did this 50 times with the ni different initial conditions, but this is, you know, the average. So what do we see? Green is expressivity, okay? So what we see is that over time, right, this is 20. This is the, the, our standard genetic code. This is, we find an approximation towards encoding 20 amino acids. So expressivity goes up, that's good. Now, what, the other thing we want to see uh, is that the distance between genetic codes goes down over time, and it does, right? So this is the distance here. So it means that there is a selection force for unification, which could go lead towards universality. In fact, we couldn't run this any longer, but the point here is actually the lowest point of the entire run. So maybe this was actually still going down. We don't know. But uh, if you read this, iterate longer, perhaps you would end up with more or less the same amount of variation as we find in the standard genetic code. And the delta code, so the error robustness. Um, so the delta code, why, what's, what's the expect exactly? Like how different are the different amino acids that you get when you change letters and you want it to be a low number, right? So less difference is good in this case. This line here shows us the delta code for the, the actual genetic code that we all have something like five point something, right? And what we have here is that on average, if you're getting into the same ballpark, some genetic codes actually exceed this value, but not by much, right? And this is nice. Actually, this is a good feature of our model because if we suddenly found super good optimal codes, it goes into the problem again that other people are saying, well, actually the, the real genetic code is not that optimal, right? So the fact that our model more or less finds the same boundary here as the real genetic code in terms of optimality is at least something that uh, you know, is in favor of a kind of communal evolution approach rather than a Darwinian approach. Now, let's look at the best table that we found. Again, the polar requirement. This is the real table. This is, one of, this is our artificial one. And you can see, uh, you know, we have like blocks of redundancy. We have uh, some similarity in terms of colors, right? It's not exactly as ordered as this one, but also remember that for us, all bases have the equal weight, whereas this one here was the one that uh, had to be put a lot of constraint of the ordering on this table. But the main point is that this came out for free. There was no selection for this, right? We start with random genetic codes, and the only thing that we ask of our protocells to do is to try to make their own codes a little bit more similar to the codes of the, of the, of the donating agent. That's it. We're not selecting for universality. We're not selecting for optimality. We're not selecting for, for these kinds of chemical regularities. And yet they appear, at least in an incipient form. 
Why is that? Well, because those genetic codes which were not optimal, which were not regular, were too difficult to learn and to pass on in subsequent transfers. Right? So those codes that had some structure that made them a little bit more learnable and pass, were passed on more frequently than others. That's the only kind of uh, selection pressure. And now, just to get into a little bit more of the details, so more, uh, Smith, Eric Smith is one of the, you know, the geniuses of the Institute. He wrote this book here, I highly recommend it if you're interested in the origins of life. In there, they basically note that uh, there's an interesting relationship between the number of codon assignments and the type of amino acid, such that simple amino acids have a lot more assignments to them in the table than complex or sulfur including ones. This is exactly what we find in our model too. And in fact, even if we factor out the fact that uh, in the 20 standard amino acids, the, these are slightly differently distributed, we still find this as a significant effect. So we could replicate that. We could replicate the regularity of the standard genetic code. A couple of other regularities that have been written about in the literature is that the number of codons assigned to amino acids right, is... Uh, inversely correlated with weight, so that the heavy uh, amino acids have less codons assigned to them. And the, the other axis is, I don't know, I have it here. Mm, what was it? Yes, yes, ah, sorry, yes. Here's it, so molecular weight is this one. This is the probability of transfer. So what we did was we took estimates of the relative appearance of amino acids in the biosphere, right? So people have tried to measure how common is each of the 20 coded amino acids in general in the environment across all organisms. Now, if we assume that as a kind of indication of how likely it was that one amino acid would be transferred in the horizontal transfer, it turns out that the ones that are more likely to be transferred also have more codons assigned to them. Right? And that's something that has been noted before in the literature, and we also find it uh, in our model. So we replicate uh, this regularity as well. And in fact, uh, it allows us to give another insight on this other regularity. So why is it that heavy ones have less codons? Well, heavy ones are more energetically expensive to produce, therefore they are less frequent, therefore they are less commonly transmitted. So this line here is actually can be derived to some extent from the, the probability of transfer line. Right? So it just means that the more energetically costly amino acids are less likely to be transferred and therefore have less codons assigned to them. Okay, so that's it to some extent. Those are the results. We managed to create a model that replicates all of the major features of the genetic codes down to some you know, very obscure regularities like this. And like I said, these are emergent results of the model. We didn't select for you know, the frequency of codons being assigned to particular amino acids. Future work, some uh, of our colleagues have noted that uh, it's unrealistic to assume that uh, all 20 uh, amino acids were available for encoding right from the start. So we could start with a subset of this, people say around 10 or so, they were most likely present at their origin of life and then slowly build up over time. I don't think this will change our results drastically. Uh, another thing that uh, is uh, possible future work is that what the researchers at LC, at the institute, were doing was they were mapping out the state space of amino acids in general, right? So it's a huge space. Like, they're, they're dealing with tens of thousands of possible amino acids. So out of those tens of thousands of possible amino acids, why did LIFE fix 20 of them into its genetic code universally? That's a big open question, right? Why out of tens of thousands do we end up with those 20 and not others? Turns out that those 20 give you a very good coverage of the functional properties of that state space. So my prediction is that if we opened our model to not just encode the 20, but actually to a continuous space of possible amino acids, it would also converge onto these kinds of amino acids more than others, because the discriminatory capability of the neural network will pick out the ones that are most easily discriminated. And the ones that can't be discriminated in terms of their chemical functional properties you know, that those won't be encoded specifically. 
Anyway, so this is something that would be very interesting to just remove that restriction and see whether our model con would converge on some of the amino acids that actually the standard genetic code encodes out of the tens of thousands of possibilities. The other th point that uh, we talked about uh, is this third base wobble. You know, I'm, I'm a bit unhappy with the way that our, our code on table looks, and it's mainly because all three codons are equally reliable, and what we really need to do is make one of them less reliable so that the other two carry more weight, right? And the third one then has to be assigned more redundancy. So this is not so easy to do in our model. I'm not, we tried uh, playing with the neural network a little bit. We couldn't really find a way of doing it, but that's something that should be not too hard, but a little bit more thought. And uh, with that, um, I thank you for your attention. Uh, with the third base uh, wobble, I, I think there's potentially uh, one of the reasons for that is a selection reason. You know, many years ago, we uh, an ex colleague of mine at Nuclearis, Henry Warbrook, we had a paper uh, examining the distribution of uh, non synonymous and synonymous, synonymous uh, codon substitutions in HIV. And the thing is, what you find is that you get a lot, lot more. Um, non-synonymous substitutions in the protein epitope mm -hmm. compared to the things that have to code for important regulatory um, uh, functions of the, of the virus. In other words, you can, it helps you because you've got that uh, uh, wobble in some sense, mm -hmm. it gives you an extra degree of flexibility in saying sometimes I want to be able to code for something where I need a lot of variation, right. and other times I need to be able to code for something where I don't want any variation. Mm. And so the thing is, you actually get an effective selection yes. that goes between the two. I right? see. So it's kind of like a um, way of regulating your mutation rate. That's like exactly that. that. So, so in other words, you put these uh, codons uh, uh, there, and it gives you a higher effective uh, mutation rate. Exactly. Ah, very nice. Yes, thank you. So I, I sent you an email with some of the papers. <laughs> Please do. I have so many questions, but I will ask you a couple. <laughs> um, I think my most uh, important comment mm -hmm. is that perhaps you are, you are not studying one of the most interesting aspects of the problem, which is the evolution mm -hmm. of the code. Mm -hmm. You are so, somehow assuming already that there's these uh, three uh, places and four uh, mm -hmm basis and so on. Yes. And obviously, I think, the origin of the, of the genetic code should have started with a couple of them, just two amino acids. I mean, information cannot mm -hmm. come out. Such a complex system of information, of transmission, mm -hmm. of, cannot start mm -hmm. spontaneously like that. Mm -hmm. I, I actually believe that Crick, I mean, he's, he's frozen uh, hypothesis is, 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 is more or less obvious mm -hmm. because otherwise, and, and you don't have it in there, I no, think. No, no. Uh, uh, there is a matter of, of, of not being able, it's complex enough already that changing uh, or adding, it's, it's like having the, the uh, for example, the, the uh, Shakespeare, no? uh, Hamlet, and then adding a letter. Mm -hmm. okay? Then you destroy the the coherence of the system. Right? <laughs> but my, I, my main comment mm -hmm. is that how did this evolve mm -hmm. in time? There are some evidences that there was a 16 uh, uh, amino acid mm -hmm. code. Uh, and, and there's some uh, species that still mm -hmm. have this remnants. Mm -hmm. I think one of your three questions mm -hmm. is more or less, I think there is a, a simple answer to them, which is why do all animals use it? And not because it, they all arrive to it, but because we come from a common mm -hmm. ancestor, mm -hmm. apparently. Once this was fixed, mm -hmm. every other animal mm -hmm. or uh, living creature uses this. That's right. Yes, so... Um 
So one interesting part here is that uh, actually we're starting to understand more and more the variability of the standard genetic code. And so now, I don't know what the count is at the moment, but it's heading up to 20 or something like that, different codes. They only usually are different in terms of one or two assignments, so it's not radically... Yes, so there are some exceptions. It's not universal 100%. Um, so there is some flexibility for change. Uh, now, about the frozen accident and the universal, last universal commonality, so yes, I agree. So Wurz's idea was that to some extent his idea was giving us the pre-story of that. So let's say, how did we get to the point that we had a functioning genetic system that with high fidelity transmission that would then mean everybody since then uses the same code, right? So then that's, that's the frozen accident and everything since. But what he was interested in is how do we get to this point? And he called it the, the Darwinian threshold, right? Because once we're there, it means that we have lineages, right, that are competing against each other and so on, where we have high fidelity transmission of genetic material across generations. Before that point, he says, we didn't have that. So in a scenario where we still don't have well-defined lineages with high fidelity intergenerational transmission of genetic material, how could something like that Darwinian threshold ever occur, right? And so what this work here does is to some extent, um, let's see. So this work, to some extent, you know, what we're trying to say is that we're heading here towards that point of the Darwinian threshold where things become good enough to ensure high fidelity transmission, right? Because as codes become more similar, they become more compatible with each other, so innovations can be transferred more easily across protocols. cells. As uh, optimality uh, becomes better, so this red line goes down, right? It basically means that even if our genetic system wasn't so well designed in the beginning, because we didn't have Darwinian evolution optimizing it, it didn't matter so much because the code itself could uh, mitigate the, the, the errors, right? So if you had a good code with a lot of redundancy and a lot of optimality, even if your translation system made a lot of errors, it didn't matter so much. So it was kind of tantamount, right? So you have two options. Either you evolve the translation system to be very good at high fidelity copying, or your genetic code is so good that it doesn't matter that it's bad, right? So as I said, before we have Darwinian evolution, what the only way in which we can get better intergenerational transmission is to have a better genetic code. And the, the key idea is that uh, in, our, in our model, we don't have intergenerational transmission at all, right? So what we're doing is we're just modeling interactions between these without any intergenerational transmission. Of course, that's also a bit implausible, right? This is just kind of like a proof of concept. Probably also some of these should die out and, you know, split and so on you know, in a kind of semi-Darwinian way, perhaps. But the point is that what we're met, the time scale that we're working at here is interactions between protocells in their lifetime rather than th changes happening over lifetimes between generations. So we're, we're talking about, you know, time scales um, much faster than normal evolution. So that, that also goes back to your original question. So, right, you know, this idea that life had to evolve very rapidly in the beginning, well, this is one response. But, of course, we're assuming still a lot, right? We're assuming that we had the triplets, the codons. We, ha we assume that we had some kind of system that could do the, you know, the, the mapping from the triplet to an amino acid and somehow link them. So we're not explaining that part, right? So there's still a lot to go. But basically, we've lowered the bar significantly by saying that we don't need to uh, assume Darwinian evolution to have been functioning already at that point. There's another mechanism which is just interaction-based, which can give us very similar results to what Darwinian evolution can give us. How did this happen? Well, you know, like I said, there's, it's a very early stage work, but uh, more and more people are looking at memory properties, learning properties, all kinds of things that can be done with simple chemical systems. So it's just that nobody had ever thought about this before, right? But now it turns out that you can implement a Hopfield neural network in a simple chemical system, right? So it's something that's gonna grow more in the future, I believe, and we're gonna get more insights into what kind of properties material systems have that actually kind of make them intelligent to some extent, right? And that's a part of the story that I think has not been considered in the origins of life story. 
right? It's just like, just like behavior hasn't been considered as any, playing any role. Also, these kinds of adaptive properties of the materials themselves and the kind of intelligence that they can emerge also hasn't been considered. It's, it's like, as the Darwinian evolution was the only story, right? That the only thing that people could think of, of what could generate any kind of order. But of course, in this center, we know there are many other ways of generating order than just evolution, right? So I think there's a lot of rich opportunity to applying those ideas to the origins of life. People in those fields are either chemists or evolutionary biologists. They don't really have this kind of complex systems backgrounds. So that was a very long answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well, one point is what uh, Alex was saying, that sometimes it's, some people say that 15 or 16 amino acids give you most of the properties that you have in life. That's just a piece of information. One of our colleagues, by the way, works on, on engineering genetic codes, and he has many papers on reducing the number uh, of um, amino acids in the genetic codes. And uh, he's using that for genetic engineering or something like that. But we also draw on that in our work here, by showing that it's quite plausible that there was an increase over time of number of amino acids being coded. And that's actually what we see in our, in our model, right? So we kind of, this goes to your question, right? So here, at the very initial point, expressivity is very low. That means these genetic codes are only encoding two or three amino acids. And only after many iterations do they start to encode much more amino acids. Well, an another point that's related to that is that um, the amino acids, you can split them into families. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with a compound that appears when you are doing the synthesis with a ribosome. Mm -hmm. It's, I can't remember exactly the name, amino acid transferase Yeah, Something amino like acid T synthetase. That ATSs. Yes, yes. yes. And there are two types of ATSs. That's right. And one of them takes you to eight, uh, eight amino acids, I think, and the other one to around other, another eight. And there's uh, some people believe that one of these ATSs mm -hmm. was more primitive than the other one, mm -hmm. and that the scenario of the origin of life came, came in two steps. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that there's a lot of discussion about that. And the, we have studied some of these things. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. We, we haven't been able to publish it, but we studied okay. quite quite a bit of that. Okay, and that has, uh, and also there you take into account some of you know, some of the things you were looking at of how the backbone. Well, here's is. here's the class actually here. So yeah. we're having here class type two and type one. This, these okay. are the yeah, these those, are the ones listed here yeah. for each of the amino acids. So and uh, so just to say that in this code, you can see people make a big deal. For example, that C in base two codes for type two all the way along here. Mm -hmm. That's a very strong regularity that people notice. And we've looked for that regularity in our work, and so here's a confession, we never find it, right? And with these molecules, we don't find the regularity. We looked across all the different 50 runs, and we, would, we never found a letter coding for a specific class of amino acid T synthetase. Mm -hmm. uh, this paper that you're talking about, looking at the evolutionary history of, the, uh, of these molecules, is also versed, by the way, I think, that uh, did this work initially. He, concludes that uh, based on this very complicated evidence that I don't fully understand, that the T synthetases actually came later and okay. adapted to a pre-existing genetic code rather than shaping the form of the code to begin with. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then we don't have a problem that we don't find the regularities here. In fact, it actually supports this idea that just based on the properties of the amino acids alone, we don't find the, back, like the, the synthetase regularities so it's more likely that once the table was in place, the synthetase is adapted to the existing regularity. Um, we had another version of the model where we included those molecules and specifically coded for them as another output of our system. And in that case, we do find regularities, but that's, that was like a bit artificial, right? Uh, we kind of like assumed a lot. Well, I think it would be very interesting if we get together and I show you what we've got. Okay. So we can discuss about that. Yes. The other thing has to do about the degeneracy in the third base. Okay. And uh, we looked at the, and this has something to do with what Alex was saying because this incorporates ideas of evolution. Mm -hmm. And we are looking at how the genetic sequences of the HIV mm -hmm. virus was changing mm -hmm. in, in time. 
you know, the, 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 when you study the HIV, then you have the possibility of looking at evolution at very, the equivalent of evolution at very short times. Yes. That, uh, 10 years gives you an enormous amount of cases. Yes. And um, what we did is instead of make, using a code mm -hmm. of four letters, mm -hmm. we used a, a more degenerate representation of it in mm -hmm. terms of whether you would have in the nucleotides uh, the, the, the two or three hydrogen bonds being formed in the double helix. And then you can say that uh, uh, what some of the nucleotides or the amino acid associated with that would be a strong one or a weak one. And generally there are those, they're like four types of, of descriptions. One is the, the one that you use, the AGCT or that one. The other one is whether they have purines or pyrimidines. Mm -hmm, yeah. The other one is if they're strong or weak. Yeah. When you go into the strong and weak representation, then you can, we, what we analyzed was with a model that we worked with about the, uh, the evolution of these genetic sequences, mm -hmm. we started, we predicted somehow that if, in the, if you just looked at the codon, this will be, uh, say it slowly, mm -hmm. look at the codon. And then what you do is that you specifically let the first position do whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. The second one, you put it uh, um, like, a, uh, like a strong one. Mm -hmm. And the third one, you put it either strong or weak. Mm -hmm. So you're letting the third base mm -hmm. be strong or weak. Mm -hmm. And you see, that, you see how many N NWSs or NWWs mm -hmm. you would have. Mm -hmm. And then what we saw is that depending on the third position, mm -hmm. we predicted there would be more or less variability in, in, in the data that you have of the strains of the HIV, which would be like quasi-species. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that what the value of the third quadrant position, mm -hmm. that one, would determine the variability or not mm -hmm. within this list of, of, of sequences. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, and this came out through considerations, mm -hmm. not of transmission of information, mm -hmm. but of interactions, chemical, mm -hmm. physical chemical interactions mm -hmm. between tRNA, mm -hmm. ribosomal RNA, and messenger RNA. Mm -hmm. and there's a whole discussion about this whole thing. Yes. But then in that, in that sense, the degeneracy is not just for wobbling or not wobbling, mm -hmm. but the degeneracy is something that's crucial in the variability or not variability. Mm -hmm. Yes. Some, now, as yes. it happens, I was in Urbana uh -huh. when we were working on this, and I had long conversations with Bose about that. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he was really curious about that because it's the first time uh -huh. somebody is talking about the third position and mm -hmm. giving it some evolutionary mm -hmm. uh, meaning. Right. And, and there's more to the story, I can tell you, because it has to do also with the structure of yeah, and all that. We have to talk more. But then, then this, this thing about the, the degeneracy mm -hmm. of the third position, it can have mechanically, let's say, mm -hmm. some meaning that can tell you about whether something has strong variability mm -hmm. or small variability. Just a comment about that. Wow, that's, that's, that's nice work, yes. Uh, we should, I, I'd yeah. love, love to hear more about it. Yeah, we'll talk about um, that. So the only thing that we really have done here is that we've looked at what happens uh, if we force this node to have a tighter discrimination, for example. So if we change these values to be very, very near to each other, so this node has a lot of trouble distinguishing yeah. between them, thereby somehow trying to represent the uncertainty of the real third base, but actually no. That, it just means that the neural network will then but extra effort to be very discriminating here rather than less. So this thing you can incorporate it, it's just more work. No? Yes, yes, so we have to think and a little bit about it. would you also be able to incorporate because the three bases are not the same? Yes. You have like a first place, the middle one. That's right. Place, These the are actually one, interchangeable. There's there, no spatial information here. Yes, yes. you can, you can uh, associate the, well, what people think about uh, yes. how important they but it's are. Yes, it's a very complicated field of research, so we should talk more. <laughs> What, what I find really interesting here, and that's what, in terms of this center and of complex systems, mm -hmm. is this is a typical problem of complexity in which different ways of looking at the problem are complementary mm -hmm. and they open windows to see what, to, to, to close of mm -hmm. how to work on. So I think this, uh, this is fascinating. I think uh, 
Well, in particular, we should talk more about it. Thank you very right, much. Thank you very much. Thank you for hanging around until the end. <laughs>